If you're grinding to achieve your goals, whether it's running a marathon, running a business, or running your life, WIS gets you. WIS is a tax and accounting firm that goes beyond the numbers, and we're super pumped to be partnered with them. Looking to level up your business or career? Make it happen with WIS. That's W-I-S-S dot com backslash J-W-S. Welcome to the Just Women Sports Podcast, where we talk to the biggest athletes in the world about the untold stories behind their success. I'm Kelly O'Hara, and my guest today is Abby Wambach. Abby Wambach is someone who needs no introduction. In 14 years with the women's national team, she won two Olympic gold medals in the 2015 World Cup before retiring as the all-time leading goal scorer in U.S. soccer history. Today, Abby continues to fight for equality in sports as an author, public speaker, activist, and NWSL team owner. Abby, welcome to the show. Kelly, what's going on? Great intro. Gosh, you you sound like maybe you have um, a future in podcasting. I, mean, I, have a, I have a current reality in podcasting because <laughs> this is my... <laughs> yes, but when you're done playing, I'm saying that you, you won't skip a beat. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I did. I did read it before, you know, we started recording, so I felt prepared. Um, how are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I'm really good. I'm a little stressed right now because my family's moving to the West Coast. West Coast? Yeah, I was wondering if you were going to um, um, say that on podcast. I didn't know if that was like public knowledge yet. Yeah, I mean, it's we're really excited. It's just right now literally the movers are here so it's pretty stressful like there's just like mayhem I just closed the door and I was like uh good luck honey I'm going I'm gonna go talk to Kelly sorry Glennon um I mean you've done many moves in your life so yes you would think that it gets easier it just doesn't like luckily I've gotten to the place where I just have decided spending real money on actually having people do it for you is the best money you can you, literally you can spend um, the ease of it. But there's still just like the random stuff that you got to pack through and you got to sort like pack this. No, not that. And I'm going to recycle or donate that stuff. It's just intense. Just the whole thing is intense and I'm happy to be not doing it for an hour. Well, I'm glad that we can um, take it off your plate for a little bit today. And I'm, I'm thankful you were able to make time for us. And I know that everyone's going to love hearing from you in this interview. Um, so we're just going to go back to the beginning and just, um, it's going to be a little trip down memory lane for you today. Uh, I can't so, wait. Yeah, it's funny. Some of the, some of the, we, the person I talked to last week, um, she was, I don't want to, I don't know when the scheduling is going to mm-hmm. happen, but she was just like, oh my gosh, I forgot I did this. Or like, oh my gosh, I forgot this happened. Uh, which mm. is, which is funny. So I wonder if you'll have any moments like that today, but, um, from the beginning, Abby Wambach, tell us about your, <laughs> your childhood. You grew up in Rochester, New York. Yeah. You're one of seven. Yes. So what was child abuse? <laughs> don't have, don't have more than like three or four kids. <laughs> I, uh, I love you. I'm grateful because I'm the last one, I right? Like I obviously I wouldn't want them to have stopped, but it was hard for me being a young kid. Too much, um, too little attention to go around to seven kids, uh, and a lot of a lot of my adult life, I think I've been trying to to deal with that that situation. Um, and it's funny the thing that that traumatizes most of us when we're young often is the reason why we're so we can excel in so many ways, right? So I actually credit so much of my soccer career and success in that industry, in that world, because I was literally vying for the attention of my parents. Like, you know, I was like that little kid who was like, mom, watch me, right? And like that attitude never ended until I retired. Um, So yeah, I grew up in a, in a, in a all Catholic um, family, so you could imagine what it was like for a little gay kid growing up in the church of, you know, Catholicism, wondering what was going to happen to me when I died, thinking I was going to go to hell. Um, and, and, you know, I think that going through some of that stuff actually has informed so much of my life and 
for better and worse. Yeah. Um, a lot of hardship, but also a lot of strength building and character building stuff inside of it. So yeah, grew up in Rochester, New York. And it's like the six degrees of separation from people who live in Rochester. Everywhere I go around the world, it was as if I always met somebody from I, Rochester. I will meet somebody from Rochester and I'll be like, I'm from <laughs> Rochester. And I'm like, yes. Did. And they're like, no, no, no. Abby Wambach is from Rochester. And I'm like, <laughs> I know. That's awesome. It's the weirdest thing. I'm like, I'm basically an A-list celebrity in my hometown of I'm Rochester, New York, you know, in other places. No, too. no, 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 no. Not even, not even close. But when I go home, it's like, I'm like the pride and joy, um, be. you know, well, I, I guess, I don't know, but yeah, my childhood was good. And, um, obviously I've started playing sports as a young kid. Um, it was pretty naturally gifted well, as an athlete. What was the first sport that you started playing? I think that I was swimming really? first. Because, yeah, I grew up with a pool in our backyard that was like such a privilege at that age. Not many kids or or not many of my friends at the time had that. And so, you know, I, I complain a lot about having so many older brothers and sisters and, and, and everything. But what's interesting is that I think that watching them being really young, like an infant, and going to all of their sporting events... Um, impacted me so much like watching them and and I don't know I just think that this thing inside of me started to build um so I was like two years old watching my brothers and sisters like jumping off the diving board in our backyard into the swimming pool and I was two years old and I was like I'm gonna go do that you know <laughs> and my my parents were like what the heck is going on with this kid and I just I didn't have a lot of fear that um, the normal kid, the normal infant would have, um, you know, I was not afraid of heights. I was not afraid because I just saw all these other older people doing things. And I was like, Oh, I can do that. You know? So having older brothers and sisters, um, absolutely made me a better athlete for sure. Um, you know, cause when you're young and you're, you're going through the system, the youth national team system, you're, you're in the same age. Yeah. Um, but when you're in high school, you're usually the youngest player. And so like all of that felt very natural and normal to me. I was never like too intimidated by older players. And then when you get to the senior team, you know, you have like Mia Ham across the locker room and I'm like freaking out, you know, but there was a part of me that had already been through that kind of hazing, so to speak, um, you know, where you're the, you're the youngest and you're trying to figure out the whole culture. Yeah, well, it seems like that was just, I mean, that was your childhood. That was your upbringing. You were always the youngest. You were always, the, always probably the last person to do something in your family. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. At what age did you start playing soccer? So you, you swam first. Was that because your mother was like, we have a pool in our backyard. My child needs to know how to swim. I don't want her to drown. For sure. <laughs> I'm sure it was that. definitely like by necessity. Yeah. Um, also, it was just like, it was yeah, there sure. and all, all summer long, all of us were always just like in our swimming swimsuits and in the pool in the backyard. Um, and I think that like before I like could really walk well, I could mm -hmm. swim. Like, I don't know. It was a kind of a weird thing. Um, but then any kind of sport that my brothers and sisters were playing, I was yeah. playing. Like I was just, I was just a little bit smaller than they were. And one thing that I actually credit them is that they never really let me win. Mm. And that pissed me off. Can I swear on this, con this, this podcast? Yes. Okay. It pissed me off and it, it started to develop my competitiveness. I can imagine. And actually, Kelly, I'll give you this. I'm going to, I wouldn't say this about many okay. people, but I actually think that you might be more competitive than me. You might mm. be the most competitive you and who else? I don't and Alex I don't know I've, and I I took a lot I mean yes I I think my competitiveness is innate and also came from my childhood 100% came from my childhood but I feel like I no you, we're we're definitely on the same level <laughs> not I don't not know you took it way too seriously you were always so pissed whenever <laughs> like something went wrong or a call wasn't made Oh, the faces. Gosh. Anyways. Oh, I'm making um, them now. 
anyway, um, <laughs> oh, I disagree. But because you are queen of faces and freaking out when a call mm -hmm. doesn't go your way, and also got a lot of totally. calls because of the because faces. of it. Yeah, 100%. I know. Uh -oh. I know. I was just having a conversation with my middle child Tish the other day. I was like, look, like referees are humans. Yes. You know, you got to be able to play the human game and, and the emotional game. Um, there was actually a coach. What is his name? Paul Riley. A way that he scouted us, he would say <laughs> whenever my team would play against his, whenever Abby talks to the, to the ref, you have to say something directly after her to the ref. So you get the last word. Do in, not let you? her. Yes. Do not let her get the last word. in. I was like, oh my gosh. She's smart. That's smart. I know. It just means that I was so obnoxious and just silly trying to like get any edge I I'm could. Not going to argue against that because I agree. Yeah. So when did you start playing soccer? How old were you? So I was five. Um, and, you know, it was one of those rec league teams. Uh, I think we were called the Red Stars, actually. Um, and it was co-ed. And I just, like, was better than everybody else. Like, just factually. And um, I scored, and it's so weird. I know this because when I scored nine goals every game, they would put me in goal. There was, like, no mercy rule. So I would score nine and then goals, and goal. then they would put me okay. in goal. So I couldn't score okay. anymore. So my first three soccer games, I scored 27 goals. Like that's, that's what I, it's my claim, my claim to five-year-old fame. Um, and at that point, my mom, after the third game, she pulled me aside and she's like, Abby, you know, like, why don't you want to pass the ball more? And I said, well, I don't understand what the problem is. If the whole point of the game of soccer is to score more goals than the other team, and I can do that better than everybody else, then what's the problem? And so she was like, okay, well, we're going to have to work on her humility <laughs> for the next 15 years before she goes to college or 13 years. Um, and, and, and the truth is that is how I saw it. Like, I never saw it as like, Hey, this is something that is making me, I'm better than because I score roles. It's like, no, we all have our roles here. Like we all have our jobs that we're good at. And from like five years old, you know, and I think that I, of course, had to get a little bit more team minded um, as I grew older. But, you know, when I was young, I just I loved sc scoring goals. I loved dribbling and I loved dribbling past people. And I loved being the person that like helped our team win and yeah. in, in, in big ways, not just like in small, small ways love to win. Yeah, that was, a, it, it's still important to me. My, I mean, if Glennon were sitting here right now, she would say that it has not stopped um, walking into the grocery store. I have to be one step in front of her. She's like, we're, she's like, look, I'm not playing this game. I'm not playing a game with you. Like you win all the time. Like I'll let you win all the time. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. See, you're more competitive not, than me. It's not like whether you care or not. Like I care. It's something that's inside of my DNA um, even with the kids, like we'll be play playing board games and they'll start cheating. Kelly, there's no wrath. Oh, I can't imagine. Like you, there's oh my no gosh. one hates a cheater more than me. And you, oh my God. I'm like, I don't want to play with you. I don't want to play with any of you. All of you suck at life because if you think that like, there's goodness in winning something by cheating, yeah. like this is you've lost, you've lost, it's wait, a wait, lost at life. Yes. Yeah. Before you've begun, mm -hmm. it is a waste of my time. <laughs> Like, and you probably would have won had you not even cheated, but here you are feeling like you need to like cut corners. It's not happening. My wife is the worst. She cheats at board games. It's like driving me crazy. And they're so smart. Like we play Jeopardy. We play like trivia games. They're way smarter than me, but I'm no, they do not need to cheat. I'm like, you silly people. You're a purist, Abby, when it comes to, to yeah. winning, you want to do it the right way. Um, and yes. I appreciate that. So when, at what point you, okay, you're five years old, you score 27 goals in th your first three games in co-ed soccer as a little wreck, um, you know, rug rat player, you know, you're good then, you know, you're good at sc scoring goals at five, you know, you love winning, you know, you're, you're the best on the field at that point. At what point were you like soccer 
is, is the thing I'm going to pursue. Oof, that didn't happen until college. Really? Yeah. I didn't really love it. I played sports because of the people. I like being a team. I like being on a team. It we're gave like, me a, an identity. Yeah, we're so similar. I was the same way, but continue. I apologize. Yeah. I, yeah. I, no, it's all good. Um, I loved showing up somewhere. I mean, partly because of my big family. I, I feel like I was bred to be on a team. Um, a lot of chaos, a lot of noise. Um, it's taken me to be out of a team at learning how much I interrupt and how freaking obnoxious and loud I am. Like I'm, I'm an affront. Like I am offensive to Glennon. <laughs> she's, she's, she's like, I can't believe how much you can talk like and interrupt people and how important it is for you to like the, what really got me Kelly. And I'll get back to like my story is like, I would start interrupting our children at the dinner table so that I could say the thing that I was thinking. That's not surprising in the slightest because you are like my, my, not my only memory, but like, or maybe not, not my best, but like my, one of my very uh, just big memories of you from the national team is your storytelling and just hanging out with you at, at meals at the dinner table. Yeah. My gosh. I wish that it was like, because I wanted to like offer you all the wisdom. It's literally because I think that there's something inside of me, this like need to be heard, this need for attention um, that I just, I, I, I've, I've really done a lot of work on this for myself for the last five years. That's so interesting. I, um, I guess I wouldn't, I, I would have never thought of it that way, but okay. Well, that's good. That makes me feel better that not everybody was so offended by, by my uh, relentless talking. Holy shit. No, I loved it. I loved um, the wisdom sharing. I feel like I just like, would <laughs> soak it in as much as possible. Yeah. Well, back to the question, I think that, um, you know, I knew that I was a good athlete. I played basketball and soccer. Um, I actually got a few scholarship offers to play basketball, but I knew, yeah, I knew that, um, that I was going to play soccer in college. And it was my goal um, to get a full ride. I wanted to not my, I, I wanted my parents not to pay for my college education. Um, you know, obviously being that youngest of seven, like, they paid for all of the other kids to go to school. And that was just really important to me. So I went on my five visits, wasn't smart enough to get a, a visit to go to Stanford, which is sad. Not that I would have ever been able to like stay in a school like that, but um, I ended up choosing to go to the University of Florida on a full ride, which was like my whole goal in life. And I was so proud of myself um, and it wasn't until like my, actually it wasn't until the 1999 women's world cup that I was like, oh, that's something I want to do. Really? Like that looks fun because there wasn't any professional soccer. Yeah, But had you been in, a, in youth camps? Yeah, okay. totally. And I was, I was, you know, I was in the U16s, U18s, U21s. This is back before they changed the age groupings um and you know I was into it in in terms of in terms of my involvement yeah. but I didn't like it I I dreaded going to camp mm. I didn't love mm. it I was just like I was trying to be like I think the rebel like that was like oh I don't care like I'm good at this thing and it, like I'm, it's not the most important thing in my life and I was like trying to be like too cool for school yeah. Um, and then when I went to college, I was like, actually, this is kind of cool. And actually I do want to do this. And so I actually started to, to invest most of my time into playing and fitness. And, you know, you know, my biggest uh, weakness as a player was always my fitness. If I was fit, I was one of the best, but if I was unfit, I was below average. <laughs> um, and so I just, I, I dedicated myself to like real fitness at that point. And that's when, when it all kind of changed for me and I started getting called into the senior team. So you went, you went to university of Florida, got there in 1998. 
freshman yep. in 1998. So 1999 World Cup happens. That sets a spark inside of you. And you're like, oh, this is cool. I actually yeah. do want to go after this. Mm -hmm. And you you end up at Florida doing quite well. First of all, did you did you go to Florida because that was the only place you got a full ride? Or were there other places and then mm -hmm. it was just Florida was the one? That's a good question. So I took five visits. I went to UCLA. I went to George Mason. And that's a random, yeah. total random school. But at the time, they were one of the only other teams that had won a championship. Okay. Um, and Jack Sakala and Jill Ellis's brother, Paul Ellis, um, they were both coaches there. And they were my region one coaches. Okay. So I felt like I know them. I'll go look at the school. I went to UVA and then uh, UNC and UF for my, my five visits. And it was really kind of down to UCLA, UF, and UNC. Um, and Anson actually offered me books to go to school at That's UNC. It. Only only books. And I was, I was like the National High School Player of the Year in 97. And he had this rule that I think it still stands today that you have to play in a certain amount of games for the U23 team or U21 team and the senior team to be able to require or merit a full scholarship to the University of North Carolina, Chapel yep. Hill. And so the balls of this guy. <laughs> I mean, props to him for having a rule and like sticking to it. Totally, I, I agree. I also think it is archaic and um, short-sighted because I might have gone there 100%. if he, you know, um, and I just, I'll never forget it. We were sitting in the airport and he was kind of downloading and he told me that and he said, we're, we're going to be, we're so thrilled to be offering you books. You're like, I don't even want the books. Like I, and to his face, I said, I deserve a full ride and I'm going to go to somewhere that is going to give me a full ride. And he said, well, good luck to you. See, props to you for sticking to your guns. Yeah. And, and guess what? So the reason why I chose UF and this is true is they were, they were stacked with seniors on that team that I was there. And so my freshman year it would have been stacked with seniors. Mm -hmm. um, the team had only been in existence for four years when I got there as a freshman and we freaking beat UNC in the finals. Like what? ever Anson so you should have handed him a book afterwards <laughs> Here's your books. There's stack there you go that's good uh, yeah that's awesome um I love that I love that and I do think that mm -hmm. that rule I don't know about still to this day but it was around when um when I was looking at colleges um but you go and you beat you beat them in the national championship we did it felt so good we did Oh God, it felt so good. Especially because the year before, um, in, in high school, I lost the state championship game, which was the biggest heartbreak of Your my life year. to date. Yeah. Senior year. That's the, my sister, out. That's the biggest heartbreak. Yeah. Of my life, not to date up until that okay, point. Okay. Oh, up so, until that point. As up a, until that point. I was like, wait, wait, wait. No, you're like, actually, I know that that's not true. <laughs> okay. 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 I can, I can name a things off of the top of my head that would would nullify that loved um, your high school jeez. yeah no so um growing up I went to the same high school as my two sisters and they were 10 and 11 years older than me and my sister Beth won a, cha a state championship and if you win a state championship you get your name on the gymnasium wall and I watched that when I was like 10 years old I watched her name get put up on that wall and I was like oh my god this is incredible. It was, it was like my Olympics. Yeah. So my whole childhood goal was to get my name up on that wall. And I'm in my senior year. Um, you know, I'm one of the best players in the country and I'm like, we're going to win. We go up, we're winning three days. I've, I think I've probably told you the story a million times. I don't, I don't remember. We go up. This is crazy. So we're playing against Christy Welsh's oh team my gosh. Why? and, and Manasquan. No, not Manasquan. I'm going to forget, but I'll, I'll remember it. Um, we're playing and we are winning three to zero with 19 minutes left of this game, Kelly, my senior year. How many of those goals, and goals did you score? I scored two of those goals. And then they, um, they come back and they beat us in double overtime, four to three. 
and I lose and I don't get my name up on that wall. I have never been so sad in my whole life. So beating North Carolina in the final was a redemption. All of my successes, literally all of the wins, all the championships, you could always like draw a line right back to like the most recent loss, like whether it be a world cup or um, something that I'm, I'm like, just, I'm blazing a path. Like I've just failed epically somehow. And I'm going to figure out how to rewrite this story to this, that to, to reclaim my power. And that's basically what I did my whole career. Yeah. I would lose and then win, lose and then so win, lose and then win. <laughs> you are much more motivated from failure than you are from success. Yeah. And I would, I would, I would say that a lot of yeah, us are, sure. I think that I think that I hate to lose more than I like to win. I think that's like, a, um, yeah, I feel like that's a component of just being a very successful competitor, not even athlete, but like a competitor. And I think that our women's national team has a totally different level of that because it's embraced. Like that kind of mentality is totally embraced and required to stay at the level for as long as we've been able to, you know, me and my past and you and your, your now. Um, it's like this, this, this relentless pursuit of excellence yeah. that doesn't mean you're going to win every time. And it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. And also it doesn't mean you are ever going to figure out what your limit is. Yeah. Like that's the crazy shit about what we do on the national team is that like every single day you have like a new goal, a new challenge, something different that you're like after. And that's relentlessly happening day in and day out. And you're you're constantly being evaluated and you're constantly trying out for the team. Every single training session, every single camp, every single trip, like it's insanity. I mean, literally like decompressing from my time on the field to like normal life has been like super interesting. And, and Glennon's like, look, because it was like so intense, Pressure cooker. like my nervous system mm. has actually, because of the pandemic and not getting on a, an airplane, my like nervous system actually kind of like settled for the first time. And I was like running and feeling good about myself. I'm like, oh, I'm not like always trying to like get to the next level. Um, and here I am like day one of training for the New York I, City Marathon. Yeah. So oh I don't know. Uh, I come, I come. <laughs> Sure. Is this turning it down? Hello, 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 hello. One, two, three. Check, check. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You're no good. Worries. Um, well, so I completely agree with you on all of those points. And I think about it sometimes and I'm like this, I don't know if this is healthy, but it's, it breeds success. You know, it makes us, mm -hmm. it's made us successful. Um, I, I can tell you, Kelly, it's not healthy for real life. True. It is really healthy for, and, and required for what you're, you're doing and the road and the path that you're sure. down but you don't need to be um, as wild um, in, in your retirement. You'll be able to calm down just a touch, but you'll still have, you'll still have a little bit of, you'll bring the good parts of it bit of into your retirement. left over. Um, yeah. So you, you said you didn't, you didn't love, you didn't know you, like soccer was going to be it until college and at college you're, you get four, well, first of all, national championship against UNC your freshman year four SEC yes. championships, SEC freshman of the year, four-time all SEC selection, two-time SEC player of the year, three-time mm. first team All-American. So you absolutely have a lights out collegiate career. And at what point in college did you say like, this is what I want to do? Like, I want to, I want to be on the national team. And at and what point did you get called into the full team? So my first camp was in 2001. Um, 
it was actually right before September 11th. Really? And um, we were we were playing in what was then called the Nike Cup. Um, I got called in to play in that tournament. I made the, the roster uh, and the first game was against Germany in Chicago. And I think that was September 9th, if I'm correct. Um, and my whole family drove over, drove, drove, drove over to, to Chicago and I played 18 minutes of that game. I got, I got subbed in and, and I think that Mia actually yelled at me for 17 of those 18 minutes. <laughs> she was like, what are you doing? And I was just like, literally, I had no idea what I was doing. I was so freaking nervous. Um, and so that was my very first game, my first cap. And, um, Interestingly enough, Heyo at the time, um, she was like 12. I mean, I think she was, I think she was 16 uh, or 17. She and I were kind of competing for that same last spot um, of most rosters for those first couple of years um, on the national team. And it's so funny how we ended up being such good friends because of those early days. Like, I'm very surprised, you know, I would get left off a of Portugal roster, a Algarve Cup roster, and she would go. Or the following camp, she would get left off and I would go. Um, and it wasn't actually until uh, the former WUSA um, league, there's been a few iterations, folks. It's not just the NWSL. It used to be the WSA, and then it was the WPS, and now it's the NWSL. Um, but the WSA, the first league, um, the first professional women's soccer league in the U.S., I was on, I, I got lucky enough to be drafted to the DC team. We were called the um, Freedom, yeah, the Washington, Washington Freedom. Freedom. I was like, oh, I, thought, I always thought it was Spirit. But then when I was reading, preparing today, I was like, oh my gosh, it was called Washington Freedom. Yeah, so yeah. And we used to play in RFK Stadium, which is so, it was so cool, you know, as my first like professional experience. Um, I made like absolutely no money. I was drafted number two, uh, out of that first draft and out of the college draft. Um, and I was pissed of course, cause I'm a competitor. I wanted to go number one, but uh, I would have been drafted to a team that two other really strong, powerful forwards were playing on. So I got lucky and, uh, in hindsight, because I got drafted to the team that Mia Hamm played on. And obviously at the time, this is 2002, Mia was one of the best players in the world. Uh, she was nearing the end of her career and um, to be drafted to the Washington freedom with her completely changed my life. Um, I just decided, okay, I'm just going to be a complete sponge and let her teach me everything that she knew. And it was interesting because um, we were such different players. She was very crafty and great dribbler, speedy, and she thought through the game, whereas I was like this big, strong, powerful forward who scored goals, used her head. Um, so if you were to like smash both of our strengths together, you would make one hell of a soccer player. But if you put two of them so, on the same field together, yeah, a great front line. Yes, it was a it was a really hard front line to defend against. And then when you bring in, people don't know this, I don't think. Um, they, they think, oh, Mia Hamm, great player. Mia Hamm is one of the, the, the most brilliant students of the game. She is smart as hell. And because of that, um, she was able to figure out how to use me and my strengths to our team's advantage um, while also knowing what her strengths were. So she was, she was really incredible at the time. And it was so important for me um, to watch her train, to see how she handled things, not just on the field, but also off the field, how she dealt with her teammates, how she worked with um, all of the off the field stressors and asks. Um, you know, it's really awesome right now because we're building this Angel City team, uh, this Angel City FC team together as co-owners and just listening to her perspective as an, you know, MLS minority owner, owner of the LAFC team um, and how she thinks about the way that teams are built. And it just is bringing me straight back to that early, those early days with her. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 
look, we were able to develop such a great connection on that WSA team, that freedom team, um, that the then national team coach, April Heinrichs, she just was like, look, we have to bring them both. Like, it can't just be Mia. It's got to be both of them. Um, And so, yeah, that's when I started getting more called in consistently because I was scoring a lot of goals in the WSA. And that's when the, the 2003 Women's World Cup was just around the corner. That was my first world championship for Team USA. I made that World Cup and um, also started in a bunch of games, which was a total shock to me. Yeah. Were you, uh, going into that, were you one? Did you think you were going to make it? Were you like, you were consistently getting called in at that point? You're like, all right, I'm a lock for this. I'm not counting players. Like, am I going to make the. No, always counting players. Okay. Was always throughout my whole career, believe that or not. I was still counting players to the end. I, it's just, I mean, it's one of those things yeah. that like you just never know. know. It's and it's based on this coach's choice, yeah. this coach's opinion, which in some ways is arbitrary. Like some coaches like you, some coaches don't. Very, very um, true. But yeah, no, I had no, I had no idea that I was like going to be on the team, let alone start. Okay. So when, when April sat me down, she actually called me down to her house. She lived a few hours away from DC. So I drove down there and I was like, well, I'm either going to get cut or I'm going to make the team. Wow. She made me a ham sandwich. I'll never forget it. Me a um, ham sandwich. Yeah, right. Uh, and she said, hey, I just want to let you know that you're going to be on the, the World Cup roster in 2003. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, and then she's like, and also you're going to be starting. And I was like, wow. oh, okay. So here I am. I'm 23 years old coming into the national team feeling like, oh gosh, like all the other forwards are going to hate me. Mm. Like Cindy Parlow, Cone, Tiffany Milbridge. Because you knew you'd um, be starting and you were going to be taking yeah, it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like that's a total, that's part of the process of the national team is when you start starting somebody, you've taken somebody's spot. Right. And that's hard. It's hard for not just that specific player, but it's hard for the friends of that player. You know, like there's real emotion that goes into it. Um, so yeah, I started in, in, and played a lot of minutes in that, in that world cup. And in fact, um, I think that I was the cause, the reason why we actually didn't win that world cup. Really? Um, mm-hmm. why? Yeah. You led the team with three goals. Yeah. So, uh, we, we found ourselves playing against Germany in the semis. Um, we needed obviously win this to get into the finals. The 99 world cup was f- Four years ago, we were back in the U.S. because the the, the tournament got moved from China because of SARS, um, and so we're in the Portland, the the Providence Park um, Stadium, and Gare Freckis, this German player, she was just tall, and the whole scouting report was Gare Freckis goes to the back post. Mm. Abby, you're gonna mark Gare Freckis, and so awesome. I'm going to mark Gare Freckis and she goes to the back, back post. Well, first corner kick of the game, four minutes in or five minutes in, something crazy early. Gare Freckis goes to the near post. And you're, you're and I'm like, at the back post. I'm like, what the hell is happening? And I was like, Julie, like who is that our, uh, our captain at the time? I'm like, Jules, this is not what the scouting report says. Like she's on the front post. What should I do? And she and Julie said, okay, mark her. But if the ball starts going back post, get back there, get your ass back there. And there's nothing worse than putting a pro athlete or an athlete or anybody between two minds. Right. So I'm like, oh gosh. And of course they, they hit this ball on a literal rope to her head. And I'm, I'm in between two things. And so I don't mark her very well, goes straight to her head and she scores. And so they're up one to zero against USA. Um, and we never could co- recover. We then start playing really in the attack. I think we ended up losing three to zero. It was like one of the worst losses in the history of our national team. And I take it to- I take total responsibility because I let my mark score. I can't believe, I mean, I can believe that you remember that. I also think that's a poorly planned defensive set piece. No, if I, who was it? April Heinrichs at the time, like mark, yeah. <laughs> mark this player, but also your zone is the back post. But um, that's interesting that you, I mean, that you saw it as I lost it for the team, even though you had such a big impact on that group as one of the youngest players 
maybe be the youngest player on that roster. Yeah. Look, I mean, look, that 99 World Cup set the world on soccer fire. Um, it made superstars out of our team. Yeah. I mean, back then we used to have alias. I don't know if you guys do this now, but we used to have to have alias names when we checked into hotels to protect people from calling our, our hotel rooms. Um, and so here I was in a position to do that, to be one of those people, right? And to help continue to raise the level of women's soccer in our country, the popularity. And then here this moment was... God, I remember just wanting to just disappear. I felt that in 07 as well when we were playing Brazil and getting our asses whooped. Um, but I remember actually, do you do you know Heather Wallace? Have you ever, do you know? She she was a, a team administrator at the okay. time and she was just telling me the other day, she said, I don't know if you remember this, but after that game, you would not get out of the shower. Mm. She said, you were just in the shower and it was just like the water was hitting you and people were like, Abby, come on, like, let's go. Like, we got to get out of here. And I just wouldn't, she said, and then you eventually sat down and April told me to stay behind. And so she's like, I had to drive you home oh my gosh. from that game to the hotel. And she said, there was no sadder person on the planet. And you just kept saying, I can't fucking believe this. Can't fucking believe that. I'm the person that lost it for our team, you know? And nobody thought yeah. that except me. I, I would be interested to hear if anyone, you know, depend, it was a 3-0 loss, obviously on those other two goals, it affected, you know, one or two other players probably played a big role in that goal going in. And I'm wondering if those players remember it. Um, but I do think it's a, it's a young thing or like a young player thing because I remember it for 2012, that was the first major tournament that I played a big role in. And I was just so concerned about losing it for the older players. Mm -hmm. And like you guys had just won the, the team had just won 1999 world cup 2003. It was like going back to back. Um, and I can also, I can, I, I can understand not wanting to get out of the shower because in the moments that I, in 2016, it's like, I don't want to leave the locker room because it, because mm -hmm. then it's real. Like if yeah. you're still there, it's, it's hasn't, yeah. it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> like totally, you don't have to face it. And once you leave, you do. And I even stayed in Rio after we lost because I was like, I don't want to go back to the U S because then it's really real. Yeah. So I get it. Yeah. Jeez. Totally get that. Um, well, thanks to Heather for offering or staying back and giving you a ride. Um, but yeah, so like 2003 doesn't work out. You guys, do you guys get third? You medal. Yeah. Yeah. We played Norway in the third place game and, and beat them. So I got a medal, but who fucking cares about third yeah. place? I don't even, do they even get no a medal out at World Cup? They do. do. You get, it's bronze. It's technically called bronze, yeah. but nobody, nobody cares about bronze medals. All right. Well, 2004. Well, at least on our team. Yeah, I know. I literally like, <laughs> whatever. Uh, gosh, that's so bad, but um, it's not bad. So 2004, turn around next year you yeah. have an insane year you score 31 goals 13 mm -hmm. assists for the team you you finish fourth in the fifa player of the year voting which is incredible for a player that young and you win olympic gold and you play us brazil in the final mm -hmm. it's a tie game you're going into extra time you score a header in the 112th <laughs> minute to win gold this is the, f and I didn't, I didn't realize, like, I don't remember this. The one thing I think I remember from that world cup or Olympics is I'm pretty sure Hayo hit the post either in the semis or the finals and like should have scored and watching her bounce back, but not to take away from your big moment. You score, is it a header goal? Or, yeah, yeah. Corner kick. Yeah. And first of many big goals against Brazil. So what was like, do you, do you remember <laughs> that? You obviously remember that goal. In the wise words of Beyonce, don't try to lessen yourself for the world. Let the world catch up to you. True leaders know that. To be successful, you have to set the pace and run your own race. And sometimes that means running a race inside an empty stadium. 
WIS is a modern tax and accounting firm that cheers on the underdog. They're the coach you need by your side to support all your business needs. Whether you're looking to scale your business, sell your business, or just you have questions, WIS is your one-stop financial expert. They're also into tech, entrepreneurship, and well, obviously Beyonce. Expect the unexpected at WIS. That's W-I-S-S dot com slash J-W-S. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the goal. Um, well, mostly I remember it just from watching it. I don't mm. actually have like a really? recollection of it in my in my memory. Yeah, my memory sucks. I, I I feel like I've done some serious damage to this brain. Um, That's probably. True. But you know, I credit all of the goodness that happened in 04 to that 03, that yeah. locker room that I spent some time in, <laughs> disappointed in myself. Um, and you know how I get when it comes to like prepping for world championships. Um, I just got so intense, so focused and so fit. Um, and luckily I really bought into my fitness that year because it mattered and it really, we needed, we needed it. We actually went, went into overtime for the last, you know, the semis and the finals. Um, but that moment was really huge for me. Um, especially because that specific game, I just, I ha I remember having the feeling of the defender who was on me that game. She just never let me get to the ball. She was just always there. Always. She was tall and strong like me. So I couldn't, I couldn't really overpower her in that way. Um, and Lil took the corner and I remember Julie Fatty looking at me and she just looked at me and she just said, this is it. And at the time, it was known that this was going to be Mia and Julie's mm -hmm. last tournament ever. And I had just spent, you know, the last, however many, nine to 10 months, however long the difference was um, thinking, okay, I'm sending them out with a gold medal. Like that's the only way they get to retire from this game is by winning. And here it was like, we've got, we've got a few minutes left in this game and, um, and Lil sends in this ball and I overran the ball on purpose because I needed to get the defender underneath mm -hmm. it. And I, it gave me just enough space to be able to jump. Um, and I remember blacking out before, like as the ball crossed the line, cause actually there was a girl on the goal line and she headed it, but it went up into the goal. Um, and it went in and then I, <laughs> So there's a little backstory. So a year prior, um, we were in the finals of the W USA championship and my team ended up winning and I scored a goal and Mia tackled me like form tackled me. So she literally brought me down. She like held my, my legs and I just like big tree fall hard. Um, and so when I scored in the, the, this, it wasn't golden goal, which is so sad. Like, freaking let's just do golden goal like come on yeah. um i scored and i started to celebrate and julie fowdy happened to be like so close to me she like tried to like hug me yeah. and i just threw like literally like a little mosquito i was like off i'm just going to run and i made the mistake because it's golden goal right i made the mistake of celebrating to the center of the field instead of to the corner flag because you want to waste now we are up a goal. You want to waste as much time as possible. You don't run to the center of the field because then the referee is going to be able to start the game as quickly as possible. So I'm like running around, like with the chicken with my head cut off. It was like hilarious. Um, and then the next, like uh, however many minutes it was seven or the most intense and scary moments of my life. And then the whistle blew. Um, and I, I honestly, I just like, I, I don't think I've ever been, as happy yeah. up until that point. Cause you know, growing up, you know, winning your first, first gold is like gold medal world cups are amazing. Don't get me wrong, but the Olympics, there's like a whole situation that's different and it, and it feels different and it feels like, you know, it's, it's a little bit more the, there's fewer teams that play in the Olympic games. And so the quality is a little bit better in terms of the play, teams playing, arguably, I bet, um, at this point. But 
I was just so freaking happy and so glad that it was over. Yeah. And so relieved. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Cause I, I wonder, I wonder if you go around asking like Olympians or any, any of the world cup champions, like what's more, are you more relieved or happy? It's so funny. The one, the only person who didn't say they were relieved was Carrie Walsh. And she was huh. in, she, maybe not the only, but I specifically remember in interviewing her, she was like, no, I don't feel relieved because I know that I should win because I did everything I needed to do. And I got the result that like I wanted and that I put in the time to get. And I'm like, good for you. I always feel relieved because wow. I'm like, anything could happen at any moment. Totally. And maybe it feels different if there's fewer people yeah, that's true. that you're playing against because there's like fewer obstacles or fewer things that could go wrong. For sure. But when you're a big team, it's yeah. like, it's it's a total crapshoot. Like when you get to the final, both teams deserve to be there. And nobody ever really plays that well, except the 2015 final. Yeah. Um, when Carly just played out of her mind, you yeah, know? Sure. Like it's so rare for teams to play well in a final. You're just like, you're just trying not to mess up at that point. I completely agree. Did you feel like, so you kind of touched on it, um, you know, Mia Hamm, Joy Fawcett, Julie Foudy, they had said before the tournament they were going to be retiring. Did you feel Mm -hmm. like the torch was passed to you during that tournament, after you scored that goal, once they retired? Like, at what point were you like, all right, this is my team? Because it did kind of become your team after that. Well, I knew that they kind of, I, I think, like, spiritually speaking, they were like, yeah, this is your team. And I tried like, I, 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 with all of my might tried to figure out how to make it my team. And I just was failing miserably those first few years, like 2005, 2006. I mean, and you'll have to remember Christine Lilly, who is the most capped player in the world. Um, she was still on the team. She didn't retire with some of her former teammates Um, and so she was our captain and leader. Um, and yet I still was trying, I I just tried way too hard in those first days. I was like, kind of like, I don't know. I think that I barked. I was like, I was always a loud leader, but I was kind of like, I was barking orders like during games, you know? Um, and so those first few years were a challenge I think for me. And also um, mostly it was just insecurity. Mm. I didn't think that I had, I had earned cause I hadn't truly. I didn't think I had earned that leadership token or that tagline or like that, that armband. Um, and it wasn't until I just started to play and to be good at soccer um, and to hold myself to the highest standard that, um, I think that, that my teammates around me started to see me more as a leader. And then once you become this leader, it's like this never, like you just never stop thinking about it. I, I can only imagine how you feel now, Kelly. It's just like, it never stops. Like you're, you're dealing with stuff that's, you know, it's not just like, um, it's not just like on the field stuff. You're dealing with like player association stuff. You're dealing with contracts. You're dealing with um, grievances, you're dealing with so many things. There's always something to deal with. And so as a leader, it's like trying to figure out like, what's the most important, like P1, like what's the priority Mm -hmm. here? Like, what do I need to get through and figured out today? Um, and so, yeah, I think that it took me a few years to settle into kind of leadership that felt real and authentic though. I hate that word nowadays. Um, I just like stepped into my full self I think actually I stepped into my full self when Pia arrived. Hmm, interesting. I didn't really understand um, how to be a leader because the only leadership I really saw was, I mean, I think I was just trying to be what I wasn't. I was trying to be Julie Foudy. I was trying to be Carla Overbeck. Um, and that, that's not me. I wasn't like them. I was different. And as all of us are, yeah. and we all have to uniquely figure out our own voice as it pertains to leadership. What about Pia, do you think made you come into your own as a leader? Or do you think it was just Pia signified a moment in your career where you had 
realized who you were, the type of player you were, the person you were, that sort of thing? Well, I think that 07 World Cup informed a lot of the rest of my career. I think I made some leadership mistakes. Um, I, I don't think that I handled, that. yeah, I don't think I handled certain situations right um, with Hope getting benched in the, in the final or in the semis against um, Brazil. And then we go on to get crushed four to zero. And then, you know, Hope steps to the mic and says what she says. And then it's just like this huge drama and huge story in the press. Um, Greg Ryan gets fired and then Pia gets hired. And so I think that that tournament actually defines the lack of leadership that was happening. And this is not to diminish Lil because Lil is one of the best players I ever played with. But I think that when you are a really good player, sometimes it's hard to evolve into a really good leader as well. Those two things aren't always um, in unison. And this is also not to say that she wasn't a good leader. It's just way more difficult when you don't have your buddies around you like she did for all of her career. Um, and and so when Pia came on board, you know, I kind of wrap up like 2005, six, seven years uh, as like my early failure leadership years. Um, you know, so if you're a kid out there wondering if like you could be a good leader, but you don't think that you have what it takes or you have not been successful at it as of yet, like, let me tell you, it's something that you can learn. Like leadership is not, you're not just born a leader. Yes. I believe that certain people have more, um, inclination towards it, have more want to be it. Um, but yeah, when Pia showed up, I just remember the first meeting, she, she started playing a song, a Bob Dylan song called these times are a change in. And I remember for those first, cause we, at the time, you know, we had just gone through this huge drama with the hope controversy and, <clears throat> and had to kind of manage through that. And then here comes a Swedish woman, um, who we don't know a ton about, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and she pulls out a guitar for our very first meeting of her an introduction to her. And at the time, I just think that maybe we took ourselves a little too seriously as a team. Truly. I think, you know, we, we had like so many freaking rules and so many ways in which we operated because it was hounded. It was like, it was like pounded into us as like youth national team players. Like, well, in order to be on the national team, you have to suffer, <laughs> like suffering. So like on these trips, we have to dress the same. We have to wear the same, you know, uniforms and, and outfits to meal rooms. Like, and here comes Pia. And by the way, all of that leadership is male oriented. Yeah. And so we've, you know, other than April Heinrichs, you know, we'd only really had male coaches and, and, and quite frankly, I think that April coached in a male way. She was just doing what the world and culture was telling her like, Oh, this is what leadership looks like. It's like, so she only looked at like John Wooden and all like the, the great male coaches in the world as people to, to, try to be like, and, and then this woman Pia walks in with her guitar and we all look around like, what the freak is going on? Like, this is going to go epically badly. This is going to be, a, yes. In, in, in those first like two minutes mm, okay, okay, okay. of that song. And then for the next two minutes, like the first two minutes, we're all looking around the room, like what the hell have we gotten ourselves into? And then those next two minutes, you could see all of us kind of leaning forward because by the way, it is a awkward moment. Like a total stranger is in front of us playing a song, singing a song and not, there's no backup. It's just her and a guitar. And so it's like awkward. Yeah. And so we feel that awkwardness and then we start to like, I don't know. I think we start to like respect her mm. because she wasn't shying away from her, this awkward moment because this is the thing that she loved. It was like music. Yeah. Music is what brought her self to that meeting. And music was how she was trying to share herself with us. And we had never seen leadership like that. Like, like, like true. This is who I am. 
leadership. And so, yeah, she did wild stuff throughout her, her tenure at, w- with us. But at the end of the day, like we never forgot that. And it, and it gave the rest of us permission to show up as our true selves. Um, and I, quite frankly, she was my favorite of all time coaches. Um, she taught me the most and, um, you know, had high expectations for us. Um, and also just loved coaching us. Yeah. Like it wasn't ever, it just, it always looked like she was having the most fun on the field. The big clap. Yes. Yeah. The big clap. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm a little bit sad that she's now coaching, for Brazil, because I'm afraid of them on some level. It is, yeah, it's definitely weird to see her in that shirt, basically. And yeah. I, I, I didn't, I guess I didn't, I never realized that. Maybe it's because, maybe, and do you think you realized it once she became the coach? Or do you think looking back now, you're like, no, that's when I felt my best. Like it was post playing and being able to look back on your entire career. Yeah. That's the beauty of your retirement at 35. You get to look back and remember like what were the big moments. Yeah. And for sure, for me, that was something I've, I, I knew something was happening in the moment. Like, Oh wow, this is something is happening right now. Like my life is changing, mm-hmm. you know, in 2011, I don't know if you know this, but she basically came up to me on the, the very first day of camp in January or February of that year. And she just said, Abby, 2011, best player in the world mm. and she just like walked away and I was like hmm. wow and that was like that was a big year because we had a world cup in Germany that year um she 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 knew that it was going to be the biggest world cup to date um in terms of fan presence and in terms of FIFA dollars um and there was just something important I, n- I didn't win player of the year that year Sawa did rightfully so um but I won it in 2012 yeah, you did. and it was because like this woman planted the seed in my head that that was even possible. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, the retrospect of my life and my career happens. It's hard to do it when you're in yeah. it. I, I would actually recommend not because um, first of all, you have plenty of time to do it in your retirement. And also there's a mentality that you have to have to continue being in it that I don't think, um, can, you can't, you can't step away from that, that mindset or mentality for too long. Um, otherwise you'll lose it. Uh, it's like a thing. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but no, I, I agree with you because I, I, I do think that, and that's why, so I think the only, other athlete that we've interviewed that's been retired is Nastia Lukin. And she definitely had such like perspective and such, cause, because she's, she was out of it and she was able to like, look back. I just think it's so, I, I love it. I, I find it fascinating. And it's like, I want to, I feel like we should, I want to hear more from you, but we can talk about it later. Um, yeah. You'll get, you have, t- you'll have plenty of time to get perspective of your career when you're done. Don't worry. Yeah, for sure. Um, so not to 2008, you don't go to the Olympics because yeah. of. Yeah. Five days before I break my leg <clears throat> in a game against Brazil, um, tip, yeah, tip Brazil, fracture. Like what moments? Man? Yeah, man. I have had a lot of moments with Brazil, good and bad. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realize it was against Brazil. That's crazy. Yeah. So 2004, we beat them yep. in the final. You scored. Uh, I scored uh, 2007. We lose to them in the world cup, knocking us out of the world cup in China. Yep. And then by the way, we were back then. I don't know if this still happens, but they, they forced those teams to, to stay in the same hotels. And so when we got back, we were meeting all of our family in the hotel. We were all so sad, so upset. And then the Brazilian team shows up and they are beating their drums they're blasting their music and it was one of those like those um entryway doors that's like a circle and there's like three like areas what are those things the roundabouts what are those called do you know what i'm saying like a it's like a big door and they got their entire team yeah they got their entire team inside that door and i remember i'll never forget it christy rampone one of my favorite teammates slash friends um her daughter 
Riley at the time, she must've been three or four years old. She started to stand up and like dance to the music. Oh, no. <laughs> she was like three and Christy goes, sit Bless your her. ass down. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yelled, yelled at Riley. I oh my God. I'll never forget that. Yeah, so we lost to them in 07 and then, um, we were playing against them in El Torero stadium in San Diego five days before our team was supposed to be on flights to go to Beijing. And I get into a tackle that I should not have been in. And I break my, my leg requiring surgery um, rod inside of my tibia still there, which really sucks now because my ankle just throbs all the time after long runs. Um, Yeah. And then, and and then the team went on to win like they didn't yeah. even need me kelly it sucked it what incredible. what did that looking back now what what did that do for you to you i think that was the most hum- that was the most humbling thing that ever happened to me first of all i mean you know me i'm pretty confident as a player <laughs> it was the first time my body um it felt like my body was revolting against me. Like up until this point, I had never really been horribly hurt. Yeah. I I was lucky enough never to tear my ACLs or anything like that. Um, And so this was like, there was something spiritual about this moment, this, this leg breaking that I really took on. And I, um, and I wanted to, to dig into the meaning, into like the real meaning of it. Like, what does this mean for me? Mm-hmm. Um, and it was actually interesting that you're asking this because two weekends ago, I was just helping somebody through an injury. And um, one of the things that I got out of this was the self-centeredness of being a pro athlete. And um really it's like almost like a just shy of narcissism um it kind of humbled me in in a way that made me understand that i was taking myself really seriously um i put myself on this in, inside of my brain inside of my heart i felt oh if i'm on the national team i have to think of myself as this high achiever mm-hmm. as this this champion this like winner right but what I realized is I was really making it impossible for myself to have real relationships because I was putting myself above everyone else. Interesting. And so this was the moment where I kind of welcomed myself back into the rest of the human race. Um, I know this sounds, I, I know it just sounds so weird to say this stuff out loud, but it's true. Like I just, I thought it was the shit. And I think it's important. I think this is so, like, this is amazing. Yeah. And, and so I think that it, um, it made me first of all, know that I could do anything and get through anything because this was the biggest, hardest thing, worst pain, worst emotional, worst thing that ever happened to me. Um, and that has also been true. Like the, the confidence that it has, that it gave me throughout my life and has continued to give me throughout my life is just, it's priceless. Um, but I think that, that, you know, there's a kind of kindness that started to, to be and develop inside of me, a generosity that I think um, I'm so, it's one of the things I'm most proud of in my life. Like it's one thing that I know to be true about myself, that I am kind and generous. And yeah. I can kind of point all of that back to this uncovering and this knowledge that I gained from this really, really tough time of my life. Wow. I love that. And you are kind and generous. Like that is, I, that is, those are two words I would absolutely use to describe you. And I find that fascinating that those. That's good. It would be weird if you were like, I don't actually see you. "Um, You should maybe self-evaluate better. (laughs) Uh, um, But it's interesting that those were uncovered or came to the surface through, I mean, such a horrific injury. Um, But I do, I do believe that as athletes, we learn so much about ourselves in in the, in the valleys and the val like injury valleys are probably the most revealing, I think for, for most athletes. Yes. And usually this is, this is my, my take. It's usually what happens in the few moments right after the like shock kind of wears off that like the reality sets in what happens next 
to a person who believes their body is a, it's a machine on some level or as athletes it in like knowing what I did right afterwards informed me of figuring out how important I thought that I was. Mm. And it, it informed me to understand what I needed to work on. Like I was literally in the ambulance, Kelly, and I called Lauren Cheney because she had just been cut from the Olympic roster. Oh yeah. I remember this. Okay. I called her on my phone from the freaking ambulance. <laughs> Your leg is broken. It's, it's literally broken. into. Okay. Yes. And I'm like, and you might hear this story and think, oh, wow, that's so, that's so amazing of you. I was like, Cheney, you need to start running if you haven't run because you're going to get called in. I've just broken my leg. I'm like, of course, I'm like trying to make sure that the team is okay without me. But also that's so self-grandizing, if that's a word, grandizing. I think it's something. Something One like of those that. words. I understand what you're trying to say. I'm like, I'm putting, first of all, I'm putting myself in the coach's role. Like I am not the person to be making that call. So when I got home, um, Pia actually ended up coming to my apartment and I was like, oh, I got to tell you something. I'm really sorry that I did this. <laughs> I told Cheney she's on the roster. <laughs> but I called Cheney and I said that she was going to be on the roster. So and she said, well, we're bringing her. I said, oh, thank God. <laughs> I didn't think about it that way, but that's <laughs> hilarious. But yeah, I mean- and that's what I did. And, and that informed me. It's not just that I was being a good teammate because I think part of me needed to feel important. And that is, I think that that is the, the thing I'm always trying to uh, learn is mm. uh, yes, I am important, but I am not more important. Yes, I am important, but I am not more important than anybody else. I think that's, that's a good way to put it. Everyone is important, but no one is more important than the next person. Totally. I agree with you. Well, not to make you feel more important than anyone else, but in 2011, you come back and you score this insane goal that I still very vividly remember because I <laughs> am sitting my ass on the bench because I shouldn't even be at the World Cup, really. You were the first one to celebrate. You were Yeah, because I was course. literally sitting on the bench being like, I, my energy can will this team to score a goal like <laughs> don't think about don't think about what you're gonna do going home early from the world cup like i was like yes. oh, maybe i could like go to the lake and i was like absolutely not Kelly. like focus yes on the game. yes you have to will you cannot think about that you have to will this team and then obviously my will allowed the team of to course win. um you and by the way every person on the bench has to be believing the exact same 100. thing Hundred Otherwise, if, if there's a break in it, then we don't score that goal. I, I firmly believe that. Totally. I, I do too. And you could feel it on the bench and you score at the time. It was the latest ever goal scored in a FIFA competition mm -hmm. in the 122nd minute of overtime. Yeah. And I, to me, that goal, that win, even though we went on to lose that world cup or come in second, which is losing. Mm -hmm. that moment was what propelled us to a different level of public adoration, I would say in the U S mm -hmm. because of that goal. Do yeah. you feel the same? Yeah, definitely. Something happened then. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but, um, after world championships, usually we have to fly to LA or to New York city to do a media tour. Um, and we, we flew to New York city. Um, I remember Heo and I sitting next to, to each other on that flight home. And, um, every once in a while she would wake up and just, she'd be like, oh my God, we lost. And it was like, yeah. it's like a, it's like a nightmare. Every time you fall asleep afterwards, you're like, oh, um, and I remember getting back into Times Square and we were pulling into our hotel and there was a sea of red, white, and blue. And at first I was like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. <laughs> and then it was like, holy shit, they're here for us. And I remember being like, don't they know that we lost yesterday? <laughs> I feel like everyone was saying that on the, on the bus. Yeah. And, and, and I think the reason why I tell the story is because, you know, that goal that, that we scored against Brazil in those like waning minutes, seconds, really, um, it did bring a level of popularity back to women's soccer 
in this country um, to a similar level that I think you felt like in 99. Mm -hmm. Though 99 felt different because it was like the first real like big time splash. Um, 2011 completely changed my life as I once knew it. Um, I became more recognizable in the world, uh, airports and restaurants and whatever. Um, and I kind of feel like it was like that, that, that push that allowed more investment in the game. Um, that, you know, now that the way that the team is rolling and sponsorships and money is coming into women's soccer, um, I do think that that was a big catalyst. That was one of the catalysts, like 99 was the catalyst. And yeah. that 2011 goal was huge, you know, cause we did it under these crazy circumstances under against all odds. Um, and I don't know, I just think that a lot of people will remember where they were when that moment happened. Um, and like a lot of people, like, I don't really remember the moment itself. Cause it was like so extreme. Yeah. I mean, do you remember like the day after Pia called us into our meeting and we each had to individually go around and like tell our own personal experience of what happened or the stories that they're hearing from back home. I thought that was so freaking cool because I remember that. I remember being able to like really live that moment because so, I mean, we didn't win anything. We still had to play. Yeah. We had to still had to play games, you know, like that wasn't even the semifinal. That was the quarterfinal game. We still had to play France in the semifinals. People don't know that. And then we lost in, in the finals in penalty kicks and it was really sad. And I'm convinced that we lost in those penalty kicks because we had to go into penalty kicks. I, I mean, by the way, we didn't even win that game against Brazil. We tied that yeah. game because that was only to tie the game. We had to actually win penalties to send us into the next round. Yeah. No, God. wait. Oh my God. That's right. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> that that wasn't playing. like the game winner. We had like a few seconds left and then we had to literally kick penalty, sh do penalty kick shootout. I forgot about and that. so wow. I believe yeah. that we lost that tournament in the finals against Japan and penalty kicks because they saw us all take penalty kicks against Brazil. Yeah. And we also psyched ourselves out and yeah, like which, but. which way, which way should I go? Exactly. Oh, the keeper knows where I'm going. And so it's like all a mental game at that point. Yeah. And of course we're going to lose blast into the back of the net well in in 2012 the seed that pia planted in january of 2011 comes to it, it blossoms into the flower that it <laughs> that it uh was to become and we win the 2012 olympics oh god i'm so grateful for that win you and alex are tag teaming up top just freaking crushing crushing soccer just are like just lights out amazing together and you win the 2012 FIFA World Player of the Year. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you had, I mean, you had now become what Mia was to you? And do you, and do you think that if you hadn't have had that, you might not, have, you might, you and Alex might not have worked as well together? Because I almost, looking back, I'm like, Abby absolutely looked at Alex and saw her strengths, saw what she could do, and saw how this could help her and in turn help each other and in turn. Yes. Yes, absolutely. The way that Mia coached me, truly. Yeah. Um, I just, I just did the the exact same thing with Alex. Granted, I didn't. I, I'm not as a as sophisticated or soccer intellectual like Mia was. Um, I just knew all the things that I needed, confidence wise, uh, as as a young athlete on the team, and that's all I did. Uh, I, rem I actually remember at the time Pia told me, do not coach Alex. Don't mm -hmm. spend too much time coaching her. Um, and I just didn't listen to Pia. It was the only thing that I like really disagreed with her about. Well, I'm glad you did it. And I'm sure Alex is too. Yeah. Well, cause it wasn't about coaching. It was just like connecting. All I wanted to do was connect with Alex. And I remember there was early days. God, it's so hard to break into the national team. It's so hard to gain respect mm. from the players who are starting and playing a lot of minutes. And I remember early on, people would get so pissed at Alex for taking shots in practice, even like, oh, pass it. They would be so pissed at her. And 
I remember watching her a few times and seeing Alex having the kind of strength that I didn't have. Mm. The strength of holding a defender off, the strength of maintaining speed and the strength of power on her shot at the weirdest freaking angles. Right. That like the angle Wild. that is so obscene and not not a single one of us would choose, oh shoot here. Not no one. We we choose pass every time. But I would see her do these things, these uncommon things in practice. And everybody would just be on her ass. Just like Alex, God. Oh. And every single time it was like it was like what Paul Riley was doing to me. Every single time I'd hear somebody gripe at her, I'd walk up and be like, do not fucking listen to them. Mm. I've seen you score goals under those circumstances and you need to keep taking those shots. Yeah. Like it is your job to miss and it is your job to find all the ways to score goals. Mm -hmm. Cause I knew she wasn't going to be like a header like me. I knew she would have to, to work on all the different creative ways like the like half chances like the quarter chances and Alex had had this strength that she was able to pull it off in these yeah. really weird moments and so that's all I did all I mean I give Alex the total credit because she's the one that put puts her body in these weird moments in these weird ways um yeah I I I was right there helping her confidence um along to be able to build into the player that she is. But at the end of the day, like as an older player, all you can do is like teach a person to fish, Yeah, you know? And, and it's up to her on how often she casts out that, that, that pole and that reel. Like, I'm not trying to like throw too many like analogies or metaphors out here, but the, it's, it's just true. Like everything that you guys have been able to create is because of you. You know, and I would, if I were to fast forward to 15, I'm sure that that's going to be like the segue to your next question. But like, I would absolutely say that this happened with you too, Kelly, like in terms of the career you've made for yourself, um, you know, cause you've gone through ups and downs with certain coaches, coaches playing you injuries, whatever, but like your spirit is um, I think the thing that has kept you on the national team for so long and um, the person that you are and, and part of that is being able to like take on what these older veterans have learned and then spin it into your own stuff, you know, like you're spinning your own web of goodness. That's very sweet of you. I appreciate you mm -hmm. saying that. You're yeah. making me a little uncomfortable. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> um, no. And, and I, I, I agree. I mean, the, the, it, I know I, I've, been so blessed to be on the team when I have been, or, you know, my career has covered and the players that I've played with you being one of them. Like I, when people ask, I attribute so much to how you led, how you played, how you carried yourself. And you, you impacted so many people, not just on the team, but off the team as well, you know, just everyday people. So um, you are a big reason why so many of us younger now we're veterans have able to be been, been successful and continue to be successful. Um, it's I'm so curious. wild that you guys are veterans. Holy know, it's shit. It's so weird. It's still the so world weird. just does not stop ticking. It's, I know, it's just crazy. the freaking crazy. time is so bizarre. How did you feel going into 2015 World Cup? You obviously, you knew you weren't, you were going to be coming off the bench. You were going to be leading from the bench talk about that. Cause this is your, that was your last major tournament. And how did you, how did you handle that? Cause I, I have very vivid memories of, of mm -hmm. 2015. Well, you know, it's funny because that whole lead up to the world cup, there was just, I just, I deep down, um, I knew that I was really suffering. I was suffering what was going on in my personal life. My marriage was my first marriage was totally on the rocks. I was basically on the road to getting a divorce and I was just so sad. I was yeah. so sad and I was struggling with alcohol I was, and privately doing all of this. Um, I mean, I'm sure you guys all knew that I was having relational issues because I wore my emotions on my sleeve. Um, but I was just dealing with a lot of stuff and 
I was also just trying to ignore it all just to get through this world cup. Yeah. And in years past, I just relied on my athleticism and relied on my ability to play in big moments to like carry me through this 15 world cup. And I just remember in those first couple of games, I just, I just knew I didn't have it. I just knew I didn't have that same itness that is required. Um, you know, I missed a penalty against Colombia, which God, I can't believe it. I missed that fucking shot. I'm so annoyed. I don't it's even like, remember that. That's uh, so funny. I not only missed, I missed it horribly. I missed the goal. And at the time, like, I think we weren't, we were, it was like zero, zero. Like we needed a oh, goal. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, round of 16, anyways. Right? Yeah. Round of 16, I think. Yeah. I just, I remember early in that tournament, not having had the real conversation with Jill yet, like how this tournament was going to go. And then as those games go on, we're about to get into the knockout round games. And, um, the coaching staff sitting me down and being like, look, you're going to come off the bench for us. You're going to remember we call ourselves game changers. Yes. I'm like, all right. So this is like fancy way of saying like, we, I got my ass benched. <laughs> um, and like, look, I'll be super honest. Like there's, there's, there are probably a handful of devastations that have happened in my life. And this is for sure. One of them. Um, I didn't really know how I was going to respond. I was a co-captain of the team, mm. a leader, a player that people um, would, you know, I was like the leading goal scorer in the world. Yeah. And here I am you're, like, you're fucking Abby Wambach. Yeah. I'm like, like, now I'm bench. I'm like coming off the bench. Like, how is this, how is this happening? Like what yeah. is going to happen here? Hold on just a second. Okay. There's just like all this tape that's happening right outside my door. Okay, Can you hear sorry. it? Sorry, um, A little bit. Yeah. Um, and sorry, we're going long. Hopefully you're safe to, Stay away from the madness for a little bit longer. Can we not take for like 10 more minutes? Sorry. Man. Okay, sorry. Um, so basically they let me know that I'm gonna be a game changer bench player. Um, and I'm devastated, right? Yeah. So I remember during the tournament. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I remember going back to my room and being very disappointed. I was by myself. And I think what's really important, like when life benches you, because everybody will experience or has experienced a benching in your life. Like we actually have a choice in this matter. And especially with team sports, when a, a person, not yourself is deciding your fate, a coach, a manager, whatever, like when somebody takes away our power or perceived power, we have to figure out, okay, how, how do I replace, like, how do I, how do I find my own power again? Mm -hmm. Where, where is my power? And I had power in my response. And so I played out both of the paths. Like, could I be a good teammate or a bad teammate? And, and truthfully, like I played them out both to the end because I have a healthy ego on my shoulders and I wanted to make sure that like my legacy, like the way that I was in response to this benching was in line with who I was as a player and what I would want to look back on and, um, and be proud of. Right. And the truth is, I wish it was like, oh, I want to be good character. Like it had nothing to do with that. It had only everything to do with winning. The, the reason why I chose to be a good teammate is because I felt like that was the only way that would give our team a chance of actually winning this world cup because I knew that my response would affect the team, the culture, like the locker room feel that energy that is, you know, at the time, like we're kind of on a roll, like yeah. we're picking up speed, things are happening. And I don't want to be a part of taking away from any of that energy. I want to be a part of adding. Right. So on that bench um, I decided I was going to be the best, bench player that ever was, because like I said earlier in this talk, I'm a competitor and I want to win. So there I was best bench player in the world. I was actually so good. I don't know if you remember this, but Jill and their coaching staff, they actually wanted me to be at the very furthest end of the, of the bench. They're like, you're so freaking loud. Like go down away from us. 
I'm pretty sure I was right next to you. So yes. Yes, you were. We were bench, we were bench mates. And the other reason is because I wanted them to know that I was still on the bench. Like I'm I'm down here. So like I wanted yeah. to annoy them enough to maybe like just put me on the game on the field. Exactly. Put me in. Um and you know, I think I I have hyper analyzed this so much. Um and people ask me all the time, like, what is your favorite goal you ever scored? Of course, it was a Brazil goal because that changed my life and for the better in so many ways. But the thing I'm most proud of in the history of my time on the national team was the way that I responded to that benching, because obviously I don't believe that um, I don't believe that my response was the reason we won at all. Like Carly Lloyd took us on her back throughout that tournament. You, Kelly, you went in and played against Germany and you got in as a sub and scored a huge goal for us. Um, you know, if they bury that penalty, like we're f- like, that's a totally different game. So yeah. I think that had it, had I chosen differently, had I chosen to like sit on the bench and pout um, and that's happened before I've seen players do that. Yeah. Then maybe, then maybe when you come off the bench, like you're, you don't have a belief in yourself. Maybe Carly Lloyd doesn't well actually Carly actually just believes in herself the most <laughs> we know that she, she doesn't need you <laughs> I'm just kidding. but I just need I just wanted the players on the field to feel like the confidence um in them was what I it, it's what I needed when I was on yeah. the field that's all I was trying to be is just trying to be that kind of teammate so yeah it informed me and, and everything that I learned about leadership um was actually sitting there on the bench that I, I had yet to learn um it has that, that impact on my life has been, um, so profound because I think that I get kind of named like leader. Like I get, I get given this leader tag because of the way that I responded. And then I get to do a speech at Barnard college. And then I get to write a book about it. And then ironically, if like you put all of these pieces together, the puzzle that it creates is me actually creating a job for myself after my, my career as a soccer player. In fact, you know, I've been able to make like five times more money in the last five years than I did in the 15 that I played as a pro athlete. So like, and it's because of this moment, it's because of the way that I responded to this life benching. Um, And I think that all of us know, like we all have a higher self, like we all have like a five, a five year in the future self to look back on and be like, how do I want to respond to this? Like, how will I respond to this that I will be the most proud? How will I respond to this that I will not cut these corners and do the hardest thing? Cause truly it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life yeah. ever. Um, it was not easy, but down the road, I was able to like spin it into some kind of gold, literally. Um, and, and, and become, um, lucrative in my retirement as like a, I'm like a professional speaker now. Like that's what I do. And it's because of the freaking benching. Truly. I actually like, I draw that line. I mean, I, I draw it too. And I think it's incredible one that it can't like your success now is based off of one of your, what you equate to your biggest potentially what you would call failures. Huge failure. Totally. Yeah. Like to you, that was a failure. And I, Abby, you, your response to that, the way that you led during that tournament, your guidance, just your presence, your energy, your entire career was impacted the team, but like your, how you handled yourself during that tournament is one of the biggest reasons that we want. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like, and you, and you know that everyone knows that. And, and I think that's, that's what I love about team sports is like people see the success on the field, you know, that sort of thing, but we talk about it on the national team it takes 23 players to win a world cup. Yep. It might've been 21 back then, but mm-hmm. it takes every single player and mm-hmm. one, one bad energy can literally ruin it. Bring Ru- the whole thing it. down. Yeah. Yes. So to you, what did, what did, what was it like to lift a world cup trophy to end your career on a high, even though you were, you felt, you know, to, it was juxtaposed with potentially mm-hmm. the biggest failure of your career too. Yeah. I mean, relief, I think, cause it was the, the one thing that I had yet to win minus yeah. that state championship, truly. 
Um, it was Never relief it yeah, that I was going to be able to step into my retirement at that point um, and not be disappointed with this World Cup championship not having been won. Um, and, you know, it was also mixed with a little bit of sadness because um, because the World Cup didn't go as I thought, as I kind of envisioned it going. Um, and so early days, I was kind of like depressed because I didn't have the impact I wanted to have. Yeah. Or so I thought, and, exactly. you know, and, and it, it's just so ironic because, you know, now, you know, people ask me all the time, not only like, what are my favorite goals or what I'm most proud of, but the thing that like has been the most interesting thing about that time and that world cup is, um, I, for some of the players in the team, the way I responded to that benching solidified in them that I was going to be a leader in their life forever. Yeah. So when diagnosis happens, when death happens, when births happen, when marriages happen, when, when, um, engagements happen, like they call me and they text me and they keep me in the loop of their lives. Um, because I think, and Kelly, you'll learn this, like when you step away, like once a leader, always a leader, like there's, I'm always trying. I'm always, I will always text you. I will always text Alex, like during championship games or championship moments, like trying to build confidence because during those times, like it's lonely, it's lonely yeah, you when you're it. at the top and you need every little bit of confidence helps, right? Because you just don't know, like you go in the game and you do the karate chop sumo kick goal. And it was not because I gave you confidence. It was because all of the little things that led up to that moment that you decided to take on and believe. And that's just like, that's how miracle like magic championship moments are made by individuals who want to believe in the freaking impossible. Yeah. And unfortunately for my wife, I am a dreamer and a dreamer that will never stop dreaming. I believe that I am like one step away from winning the freaking lottery. Like literally, like she's like, seriously, you don't understand Abby that you've already won the lottery. Like, first of all, you were born with a natural gift for sports. Yeah. Then you went and played like at the highest level for many years. Then you were able to turn your life into like a professional speaking career. Like you literally are the definition of lottery, but like, I'm still like, Oh, what else can we do? Like, I want to like, I want to be an investor and I want to be an entrepreneur and I want to be a business owner. I want to be like, whatever it is, like I want to be a part of and, and do. Um, and that is because I have like the belief in myself and the people around me. And, you know, being on a team, especially with the, the national team, being around those kind of women who wholeheartedly individually believe that they are all the best in the world, rightfully so. Yeah. And embrace and that in individual belief in each other and themselves is embraced as is the collectiveness of buying into whatever it is that goal is for that specific game or that tournament. And the, 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 the combination and the enmeshment with that individual and the collective is what makes our women's national team so special. It's like that team, what I call Wolfpack vibe and environment. And that's all I'm trying to do now is just like recreate that vibe and that environment every single place that I go, because I know that the more of those embraced individuals find each other, like the more magic you can create. I absolutely agree. And I feel like even though we are kind of the um, microcosm of it on the national team, this, you know, very specific instance of collective power, collective energy, individual, you know, embracing your individual self, but then the collective and what you can accomplish. I feel like it's applicable to so many places and things in life. And, and I, I feel like I, I learned that from you and, um, and I'm so thankful. And, and you have just had like such a huge impact on, on my career, on that 2015 world cup. Um, and again, it's just the way it's, it's your energy. It's how you carry yourself. It's your mindset. And it's, it's one, it's one in a 8 billion. You're like, just, oh, yeah, it's awesome. that's sweet, but it's hard one, right? Like I had to learn some tough lessons and had to go through a ton of shit yeah. to learn this. And so have you, like, you are an amazing leader in your own way. Um, and the national team, you know, I, you'll learn this when you step away, but like, I'm just like now the biggest fan of y'all and watching you 
um, file lawsuit against U.S. soccer, watching you win and, and raise your own trophy in 19, that had to feel really good playing shit ton of minutes and being one of the most important players on that field as a leader. You know, there's nothing like raising that that trophy when yeah. you know you've had a real impact. And um, I don't know, I just, I'm so proud. You guys make me so proud. Well, we, you you did it for us for so long. So we're just trying to make sure that we keep it going. Yeah, um, the gals. So we, I've had you for way too long today, um, but we're gonna- Oh we're shit, gonna, Yeah, we're gonna We're gonna uh, close <laughs> with some repeat questions. I'm gonna send you a bill. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the JWS podcast is presented by Heineken and celebrates women in sports at the top of their game where each athlete is unique and successful and has a story to tell. So who's been the one person in your life that has had the biggest impact on your career and why? And just so you know, Heineken 0.0 is delicious and is zero alcohol. So we'll cheer. Well, that's that. good. Exactly. 0.0. <laughs> that's, that's my, that's where I roll. I'm five years yeah, sober. Exactly. Um, the person who has the biggest impact. Um, well, I, I have like different stages of my life. Obviously right. my parents, when I was young, yep. that birthed me. Um, and then I would say probably all of my teammates. Mm. And then now my wife, my wife, Glennon has completely saved me from my professional athlete self. And I hope that you, um, can find somebody like that, Kelly, when, when you retire or, or I think I have good, good. <laughs> and I'm so glad that you have, I know, I know. Well, cheers to all of them. Mm -hmm. Um, because they, like you said, have shaped you and made you into the athlete that you, that you were, that you still are. Cause you know, an NYC marathon coming up and yeah, the person yeah. that you are. Um, all right. They say work hard, get lucky. How much of your success is predicated on luck? Oh, well, I think some of it, I mean, um, I think working hard is most of it. I think luck is some of it, um, trends and forces, like whatever, whatever's happening in the world, um, matters. And I think feminism and women's rights have been kind of a topic of conversation. I mean, quite frankly, since the 99 world cup for us women athletes, um, and it's just going to keep getting bigger and better. So, yeah, I mean, it's all for me, if I put the work in, the luck kind of usually takes care of itself. Would you put it, can you put a number to it? Well, you have yes, to I would it. say 90% work and 10% luck. All right, I think we've gotten one of those um, from someone else. So 90, 10, and then last question. Mm -hmm. You've accomplished so much already on the field and off the field. Mm -hmm. Where do you go next and how do you keep pushing? I'm going to uh, Los Angeles to yes. be a co-owner of the Angel City FC team. And my team will just kick your ass's team all over the field, unless you're on our team, which I'm hoping, I'm hoping to like, you know, recruit you. <laughs> I mean, you know, I love to surf, but I'm spirit right now, baby. And sorry, as long as I'm on another team, you're going down. Yeah. Well, we'll see about that in 2022 right. when we feel right. the team. Well, I love it. Um, Abby, thank you for the time today. Thank you for everything that you've done for me personally and for the women's national team, for women everywhere, for the world. You're amazing. I love you dearly. Um, and keep crushing life. Love you, sister. Take care. Happy to be on and do this. Keep crushing it. Sometimes to succeed, you can't do it alone. You need a team that understands your business on a personal level. WIS takes a progressive approach to help you win. Think less calculators, more conversations. WIS is a proud supporter of this podcast and the JWS community. To discover how WIS is more than just an accounting firm, visit wiscom slash JWS. That's W-I-S-S dot com slash JWS.